two or three times in the last week, <clears throat> I've read the same statement. It's kind of an interesting statement. It uh, comes from the idea of being mentally healthy or fresh, and not from any religious source. Um, I get a teacher's magazine that talks about how to stay healthy. And it talks about not defining oneself by what one does. But rather, to de- if you're going to define yourself, to define yourself by who you are. Well, that, that's an interesting idea because an awful lot of people are what they do. And uh, very often they can't relax and, and uh, be somebody else, in other words. You know, if, uh, I always think of the marine drill sergeant, that tough as nails guy that's pushing the recruits through. And that's the persona that he has. And um, I bet those recruits don't ever think that he sits down and takes his hat off and maybe loosens his boots and has a cup of coffee and just relaxes. But uh, everybody hopefully relaxes at some time. And if they don't, well, we don't see them for very long because they have strokes and heart attacks and die from the stress of everyday life. So we know that drill sergeants, they know how to relax, but when they have to play the role, they play the role. And to a large extent, that's what it is. We all do a certain amount of role playing, and there's, it's not pretending, it's simply doing the job. Um, my teacher used to always fascinate me because with the exception of when there was a ceremony going on, he always looked almost too casual. I say almost because I was trying not to judge, but he would always have a little smile on his face and he would be busy going about doing whatever needed to be done. But when it came time uh, for the ceremonies, then things changed and he got very, very serious. Well, that's a pretty normal thing. Uh, We tell children sometimes that they have to be serious about their studies or they have to be quiet and respectful when they go to church. So there are different situations where we act differently. And it was always so unique because when these big ceremonies would come up, he would put on his very best yellow robe and his very best uh, robe of many pieces, his rice field robe, and, and he had a hat he wore, which kinds of looks like the Catholic uh, bishops had only turn around. And uh, lots has been going on over the last couple of weeks because of the Pope passing away, and so you see all of these bishops and cardinals wearing their hats, uh, which always looks like a lotus leaf to me, you know, just one leaf pulled off and stuck on their head. Well, Within the Chinese-Vietnamese tradition, there's a hat that looks very similar, only it's just turned around so that the leaf is seen by the side. And it actually represents the gasho we make, the the clasping and the hands together. That's what the hat represents, is um, this greeting and showing of respect. So my teacher would put all this stuff on, and, and I used to always say he loved to parade because he would have layers of stuff, and he'd have big beads and all of this business and it was about showing respect, and it was about making the ceremony serious. And it was certainly about dressing up for the people that were coming to the ceremony so they would know that he took, took it very seriously, which he did. And no matter how long the ceremony lasted, he was always very serious, didn't crack the smile. Everything was done. But after it was over with, and he took the hat off, and he took some of the layers of clothing off, then he was back. He was that very soft and gentle man with a smile. And he never really went away. It's just that he was practicing being serious for a while. A lot of times people get serious in their lives, and they never learn how to relax. They never learn how to be soft and smile. And, of course, this causes a lot of problems. It causes problems within their family. Sometimes it causes problems at their work. But it causes internal problems with them 
because if they never can relax, it means the mind never relaxes and the body never relaxes. And they're completely wound up. They have a 24-hour workday. I've always kind of amazed when I read about these tycoons of business and industry that work 18-hour days. I find that phenomenal. I don't find it phenomenal that they might work an 18-hour day. I find it phenomenal that that's what their day is, day in and day out. I really don't understand how they do it, except they tend to burn out very early and, and pass away at a young age. But most people need five or six hours of sleep. So I have a hard time understanding how they get that five and a six, five or six hours of sleep. I need a little more than that. I used to go for years on five or six hours. Five hours was a very normal thing. Of course, I used to go around being tired all the time, but other than that, there was no problem. But when I read about the guy who works 16, 18 hours, I think, well, doesn't he ever take a shower? You know, aren't there meals in there? But of course, they work through the meals. They never let it down. The tension stays there. And they have all of these little problems like ulcers that really are the red badge of courage for them because you can't really be a serious mover and shaker unless you have these kind of physical problems demonstrating that you're dead serious and that you're going to work seven days a week and you're going to work 24 hours a day and you're going to consume yourself with this kind of tension. And they certainly define themselves by what they do because they don't do anything else. And so when you look at one of these important people that are captains of industry, the people that have the multi-million dollar homes, the people that on a whim can ruin the lives of other people by simply telling them they don't have a job anymore. Um, You would have to define them simply by what they do. But the average person, even though they spend the majority of their day doing their livelihood, have other aspects to who they are. Most people work an eight-hour day. Some people work a nine- or ten-hour day. But there's still some day left so that they may be parents or they may be a spouse or they may be some other activity they do. They may be very involved in their church so that there is a balance in who they are. They may have a hobby that they pursue. And that hobby is a very consuming thing for them, but in a different way, that they can relax and enjoy their life. So, as I read this over and over, it just seemed to keep popping up in places. Don't define yourself by what you do. Define yourself by who you are. Well, the whole practice of Buddhism is about who you are. And it's really not about what you do. Now, we have groups across the world that think that Buddhism is what you do. In other words, if you live in China, Buddhism is being a vegetarian. And that's an important part. What people eat is an important part of their life. Matter of fact, eating is very central to being human. We don't simply gobble it down. For some cultures, eating is very much a social occasion. In many cultures, eating is when the family gets together and we express our humanness beyond what we do for a livelihood. So what kind of food we eat becomes a very defining thing. And uh, we're aware of it. If we know vegetarians, uh, they tend to be very active about being vegetarians. They want to let everybody know there's a ve- they're a vegetarian. And if you stand in one place very long, they'll try to convert you to being a vegetarian. And there's lots of reasons to be a vegetarian. There's political and economic reasons to be a vegetarian. Uh, there's health reasons to be vegetarian. And in some instances, there's religious reasons to be a vegetarian. So you never quite know what you're going to be, at, what front you're going to be attacked on, and the worst thing in the world is get a vegetarian that can tell you the social economic impact eating meat has on the world, how much healthier you'll be if you don't, and how 
religiously you're not supposed to do that because there are some Christian groups like Seventh-day Adventists that encourage being a vegetarian. And there's not a, hardly a word you can say in defense because by the time they get done, they will show to you that you are doing a great evil by not being a vegetarian. And so they define themselves by their religious activities. And some people do that. Some people ha hand you a religious tract the minute you walk in any door that they're standing next to and define themselves that way. Look, I belong to this religious denomination or sect, and you should too, and let me tell you why. I remember as a kid going to a Methodist church when I was very young and being kind of curious about the personal lives of the people that were in the church. Not little secrets. I just always wondered what they did when they weren't in church. You know, that guy that was always smiling and always happy and always friendly and always wore the nice suit and the red tie and the little vest his wife made for him so that every year he had three or four little vests to wear. That's when vests were popular. I always wondered, what does he do for a living? I know what he does when he's at church. Probably not important, but at least for those days that we met, they defined themselves by their church activities. Sometimes this can be talked about in a very negative way. We hear people talking about, well, they act different when they're at church than they do during the rest of the week. And they talk as if that's a very, very bad thing. Well, it's not necessarily a very bad thing. When you go to church, it reminds you to behave. It reminds you to be friendly. It reminds you during certain occasions to be serious. It's not a false person that's there. It's only a false person that's there if they are hurtful during the week and helpful at the end of the week. Church is supposed to remind you how to act the rest of the week. Don't define yourself by what you do. Define yourself by who you are. The big question, who are you? It's not an easy question to answer. If you have a quick and easy answer, you don't understand what's being asked. Nobody's asking you how old you are. Nobody's asking you whether you're a Democrat or a, an Independent or a Republican. Nobody's asking you whether you like, believe in big, governors, big government or small government. Nobody's asking you what religion you have. Nobody's asking you what you do to make a living to put food on your table or what you did. People are asking you, <clears throat> all those things aside, who are you? How do you live your life? How do you touch other people? Thinking about this today, I thought about, because <clears throat> I'm in the next few years I'll be retiring someday, I think, maybe not, maybe that's just an illusion I have. It's a dream that will never come true, this idea of retiring from having to go to work to put food on the table so that I can do other things. <clears throat> so maybe that's just a dream. But the uh, governor, Mr. Schwarzenegger, very actively was attempting to destroy the retirement system for teachers. So we've been a little conscious of him lately, been a little conscious of retirement. He was trying to get a bill passed. That first he would do it with the teachers, and then it would be set up for every other public service where basically they didn't have a retirement. And that government retirement, that's a pretty attractive deal. It's the reason a lot of people go to work for the government, not for the big pay, because usually the pay isn't big, but you get the reward at the end of your life. It's kind of like the military, you know. They get paid lousy pay, but... They have this really nice retirement when they get done. And that's the way the military used to sell it. We won't give you much now, but we'll take care of you later. And um, so I've been very conscious of that. And been talking to a number of people who are close to retirement. Yesterday, I spent most of the day with someone who's been retired for the last two years. She taught for over 30 years. So if we ask the question... 
don't define yourself by what you do, what does a retired person do? We're in trouble. Because if we're going to define ourselves by our occupation, then we're in big trouble because, well, they're retired. Well, by golly, I guess we do define people by being retired. When we talk about someone and say, do you know so-and-so? Well, yes, I think I do. Well, they're retired, you know. Just like we'd say, well, you know, they're a truck driver. Like that tells us something about who they are. Is there a common uh, <clears throat> personality feature of a truck driver? Used to be that truck drivers were all courteous. That's what I was taught when I was a little kid. Best drivers on the road and always courteous. Now, I think, I, yesterday after driving almost to Nevada yesterday, I think we can define truck drivers as being the most discourteous drivers on the road. Those are the young ones. And I remarked yesterday, well, they drive their trucks just like you drive a car. Only the thing's really, really big and it can squash you when they go in and out of traffic and block the prog you know, progress up a, a grade because they don't want to slow down four miles an hour because a truck in front of them. So is that who they are? I don't think so. I think the Buddha would have said that we do not define ourselves by what we do. We define ourselves by how we do it. I think it's a very sad commentary if we're going to judge the worth of a human being simply by the job they do. Although that's pretty normal in society. I think people have a tendency to look down on janitors or custodians and be very impressed by CEOs and people like doctors and lawyers. And of course they encourage it because it helps them in some sense do their job better if you're intimidated by their degree or their title. They can express their power. They can exert their power. Uh, I don't think custodians have a whole lot of power as we think of power. I don't think anybody's going to sit up and take notice if a custodian says we're out of toilet paper. They might order some, but they're not going to be intimidated by the custodian. And yet all you have to do is ask anyone that works in any kind of office or any kind of facility that is cleaned by a custodian. Not all are. You go to the supermarket, there isn't a custodian. The people that work there stocking the shelves usually are also the ones that clean the floor. But you walk into an elementary school teacher's classroom where the trash wasn't emptied and the desks weren't cleaned and the floor wasn't vacuumed and this went on for week after week, the teacher would be pretty upset. And they would explain to you why they were upset that they have a, a long and attention-filled day dealing with these children and when they come in in the morning they expect to have their room clean. They don't expect to also have to work overtime doing these tasks. You have a business, go to an insurance company. Every night after the company closes, a service comes in and they empty the trash and vacuum the floors and polish the glasses. And after a few weeks of not having this service taken care of you, as you go in there, <clears throat> customers start to distrust the insurance company because we expect successful businesses to be clean and bright. We don't expect them to be trashy. So the custodian, whoever that might be, by the way they do their job, they have great influence over other people. We just don't think of them as being powerful. But the influence is there. You go to a restaurant. I ask you, how was it? And you say, it was okay. It wasn't that great, but it wasn't bad. I heard somebody make this remark yesterday about a chain of restaurants. Well, they're not that great, but they're not that bad. So why would anybody go? Their prices are very reasonable. If we go to a fancy restaurant where it's going to cost us 20 or $30 to have a meal, we expect the food to be really good. We're not going to put up with, well, they're okay. It has to do with about how somebody does their job but also how they do their life. And so the question becomes not, what do you do? 
but how do you do it? Someone I know, their brother passed away. He'd been retired for 31 years. I met this gentleman, I don't know, 32 years ago, 33 years ago. Uh, worked for the government all his life as a hospital administrator. For the last 30 years, been retired. Who in the heck was he? It's a hard question to answer because we tend to always define people by what they do or what they did. So sometimes we say, well, they're a retired school teacher. Well, they're a retired truck mechanic. Well, he used to work for Lowe's, but he retired. And then there's this big void. What does he do? And I would suggest that it's not anything to worry about. The question is, how does he do it? If people go through life doing things very well, being concerned about the quality of what they're doing, the attention they're paying to it, <clears throat> while staying relaxed, then as they move into later life, they're going to approach everything out that way. If they stayed busy when they were young, they'll be busy when they're old. I hope. Because to retire and stop doing things is to die before you die. When I was young, I went to work at places and I watched people retire and die. I went to work at one place, three guys retired and two, two were dead within a year because they thought retirement meant don't do anything. It's a pretty silly idea. So I'm reading this article in this teacher's magazine and it's talking about staying fresh, staying youthful, staying healthy. And it talked about the mind. It was a whole, the whole magazine was about this, but there was an article on the mind. And I heard things I'd heard before. Take a class. Doesn't matter what the class is. Doesn't matter if it has anything to do with what you do in life. Take a class and stimulate your mind. Learn something new. Do something new. The class could be quilt making. The class could be how to paint china. The class could be anthropology and uh, you teach choir. And there's no connection between the class you're taking and, the, and what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Just do something new. Stimulate your mind. The old monks didn't take classes. They were kind of stuck. There was no place to take a class. They couldn't go out and take a history class or a mathematics class or a science class or an art class. They couldn't do that because there was no place to take it. Our educational system in the West, as we think of it, hasn't been around all that long. Not the way we're used to seeing it, where we could go over to a community college and for $100 take a high-quality class and be stimulated. So what were these guys doing? Did they just shrivel up and die before it was time to die? I always think of Hakuin, who had some physical health problems and is the great reviver of Zen in Japan because he came out and just gave it a big shot in the arm and said, let's get going again. It's time to stop sitting around and wearing fancy clothes and talking like we know what we're talking about. It's time to start meditating again. It's time to start asking hard questions again like, who am I? And <clears throat> he worked with anybody that w was willing to work with. He was an extraordinary teacher for no other reason. And of course, he's highly criticized for this, but he would give certification to anybody who would study with him. He gave it to laymen, which is really not that common. To certify a monk as an enlightened being and a teacher, that's one thing. To certify this guy that his job was a rice farmer and he did meditation with a master and had enough of awakening that he would certify. But by golly, he certified women too. He certified people so often that people wondered if they meant anything. What was Hakuin doing? He lived in a temple, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. There were no cities near him. There were villages and farms. 
in Japan today, because Hakuin didn't live that long ago, in the 1800s. In Japan today, there are inns and there are noodle shops in the villages close to where he lived that have signs hanging in front of them that were painted by him that are considered national treasures because he was a great calligrapher. So he practiced calligraphy, which has always been looked in the East as an art, not only just a way to communicate, but something that can be expressive and an art. He painted that same ink he used to write the characters he used to draw pictures of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and the wildlife around his temple. He wrote poems. But that wasn't his job. His job was taking monks that had gotten tired of the status quo and wanted to do something more like maybe become, become Buddhas and to teach them in a drafty, run-down, roof-leaking zendo where every time it rained you got wet while you were doing meditation. And his students kept complaining because they got wet during the meditation and he'd say, well, we have a choice. We can fix the roof or we can meditate. We'll meditate. He was tough as nails Zen master who liked to play with kittens, who never turned anybody away, who could write poetry and sing and paint signs and do whatever needed to be done to his very best because he treated every activity, every single thing he did as if it was the most important thing he did in his life. And I cannot imagine Hakuin saying, well, that's good enough. That'll do. But he also did not do it over and over and over again because he couldn't become happy with what he'd done. He did not set an impossible standard for himself, but he set the standard of doing things the very best he could. And that was everything in his life. And if we define ourselves by who we are, someone who does the best they can with everything they do is a good definition. We don't have to worry about whether they're better than somebody else or less than somebody else, more powerful or completely powerless. We don't even have to talk about talent. All we have to talk about is how we approach life. And the Buddha approached life 100% all the time. And that's what the Zen masters attempt to do, and that's what they attempt to encourage other people to do. Define yourself as the person that does things 100%. And that's everything. That's washing dishes, taking a bath, going to the toilet, talking with your friends, listening to someone, creating great pieces of artwork, or creating things that only your mother could love. 100% is the most you can give. We joke about or talk about the powerful person who works 120%, but the reality is that's a little liberty there, a little poetic liberty. 100% is the most we can do. If we do 100% with everything, we have a good life. There is no recrimination. So don't define yourself by what you do, that you're a clerk in a store or the driver of a bus. Define yourself by how you do it.